Cool. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Michael from Hedge Fund Alert. Thanks very much for uh, taking the time to be here today and for putting up with us, especially in advance. Um, I would like to first just kind of go down the line and introduce everyone. If you wouldn't mind um, just saying who you are, where you're from, and a little bit about your connection to the panel, that'd be great. My name is Mark Leeds. I'm a tax partner with Mayor Brown. Our offices are here in Midtown. Uh, I do a lot of work with private funds, and lately that has been uh, intersecting with uh, social investing through the mechanism of what's referred to as qualified opportunity funds. Uh, those are funds that uh, invest in economically distressed areas and provide some significant benefits for investors, as we'll discuss later. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan Burrell. I'm a partner and portfolio manager at Skybridge Capital. We're a, a New York City-based alternative asset manager. Currently oversee approximately $10 billion. Uh, our flagship product is a uh, multi-strategy fund of hedge fund uh, that you know our team has run since 2005, going back to our time inside of uh, Citigroup, uh, City Alternative Investments. That business was acquired by Skybridge in 2010. Uh, today, on this panel, I'm talking about our Opportunity Zone Fund, which uh, is a product that we launched late in 2018, uh, and um, obviously is quite exciting from a from both a, you know, a tax incentive uh, return and, and impact perspective as well. So uh, that is the, the topic of the day today. Hello, everyone. I'm Tarsis. I work for Axioma. We are a leading provider of portfolio analytics and risk analytics. Um, responsible for uh, strategic innovation, product incubation, using AI and different analytics. And uh, one exciting uh, new development that happened with us is that uh, now we are part of Contigo, which is a new firm that was formed uh, after the merge with the index business from Deutsche Börse, namely stocks and DAX. So we are part of Contigo today. And today I'm going to be talking um, more about how AI is transforming uh, ESG investing, the opportunities and the challenges. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it. Um, I'd like to start with Mark, actually, and as a, as a bit of a preface, I think for a long time, as a lot of you know, and everyone on the panel knows, this whole idea of impact investing, of opportunity zones, of ESG investing, all of these interrelated things that do that function slightly differently were looked at by a lot of allocators, especially large ones from the endowment level on down as kind of something that well, it might be nice, but might not be able to match the return, and even can match the return, what are the tax benefits? And more recently, we're seeing a lot of institutional interest in all of these <laughs> kinds of strategies, and there's some solid tax reasons for that. And Mark, if you would like to go into those a little bit, I think that would be helpful. Sure, it's probably worth by backing up a little bit before we hit the actual tax advantages by how this legislation works. Uh, Congress put, enacted a statute which invited all 50 states and the protectorates to submit census tracts in which uh, there was low-income low uh, people that needed uh, development. So each of the 50 states and uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, uh, Virgin Islands submitted a list of census tracts that would be eligible for a tax advantage investing. In mid-2018, the IRS responded, issued a, a close to a 300-page notice with respect to all of the census tracts that were going to be eligible for this uh, investment incentive. So it's really since that day when we had the issuance of the eligible census tracts that the legislation and the opportunities have really taken off. And the way that the statutes work and the way that you're incentivized to put your money into development projects in these low-income census tracts is through this mechanism that the Internal Revenue Service in Congress has called Qualified Opportunity Funds. And the statute itself is unusual in that it really tries to do two separate things using a common set of definitions. And so we're going to do our best to keep those things separate so that you can see um, how the statute works and um, how you can take advantage of, of these opportunity zone investments. The first thing it does is it, there's a gate before you can get into this. And that gate is that you have to have recognized capital gains. And those capital gains have to be recognized within 180 days of the date in which the investment is made. There is some flexibility in there um, for gains recognized through partnerships in that the, the 
the start period uh, begins at the can, can begin as late at the end of the taxable year instead instead of the date on which the gain is recognized. But the way that the statute works is if you have recognized capital gains, there's no earmarking of funds. But if you make an investment of cash within 180 days of the date that the capital gain is recognized, that capital gain can be deferred. The tax on that capital gain is deferred until December 31st. 2026. So that's currently a seven-year deferral of the tax liability, which is in and of itself a fantastic uh, tax benefit. But it gets better than that, because if the investment is made and it's held open for five years, then the 10% um, of the tax is forgiven. If the investment is held open for seven years, another 5% of the tax is forgiven. So because of the December 31st, 2026 uh, drop dead date, in order to get that full benefit at seven years, you have to make the investment in 2019. Obviously, if you make the investment in 2020, then you won't, won't have the seven-year hold period by the time uh, December 31st, 2026 rolls around. So in, in a sense, the benefit's a little bit limited in that um, it, it's time sensitive. Doesn't mean that investments <laughs> in 2020 and thereafter won't continue to be attractive, but the, the the, the free, the free uh, exemption from tax will be limited to the 10% for five years. And even if you invest after 2021, so you can't meet the five-year hold period, you're still going to get the advantage of the deferral. So essentially, there are three advantages for making an investment into an opportunity fund. And that is, first, the 10% exemption, second, the 5% ex exemption, and then third, the deferral until 2026. Obviously, if you dispose of your investment before 2026, uh, you'll have a gain recognition event. But the rules themselves there even are very, very liberal. If you invest in a qualified opportunity fund project and you get a wonderful offer that uh, overrides your tax consideration so that you want to dispose of it early, and you do so, you don't necessarily have to pick up the gain at that time. You can reinvest within, if, if you reinvest within 12 months, you continue to have the right to defer the, uh, uh, the capital gain. So that's a really nice rollover opportunity that they offer. So the, so the first set of tax benefits revolves around recognized capital gain, which as I mentioned is also a gating issue to get into the structure. And if all that weren't interesting enough, and I suggest that it probably would be for a lot of people, the gain, uh, the, once you make the investment into the qualified opportunity fund, it gets even better. And that is because if the investment in the Qualified Opportunity Fund is held open for 10 years or more, all gain on the disposition of that investment is tax-free. So that offers not only opportunities for U.S. taxpayers, but it also offers opportunities for non-U.S. <coughs> taxpayers, because this would override what we know, what is the special tax that's imposed on non-resident aliens when they invest in U.S. real estate, known as the FERPTA tax. So it's a complete tax exemption for enterprise gains. Now, on that investment into the Qualified Opportunity Fund, there is no tax benefits offered for rents and other income earned during the life of the transaction, but the disposition gain um, is completely free if it's held open. And it absolutely uh, has to be recognized by 2047. So there is an outside limit to this, but the really good news is, is that if the investment in the Qualified Opportunity Fund is held open for at least 10 years, you're going to not, you won't pay any tax. And furthermore, because the second track of the statute relies uh, from definitions on the first track, if the investment in the Qualified Opportunity Fund is held open for at least five years, you get a, a free 10% basis step up in your investment, uh, which means that if you dispose of it after five years, you'll have less gain. Obviously, <laughs> if you continue to hold it for 10, you'll have no gain. And then if you leave it open for another two years, you'll get another 5% basis step up. So that five and seven year uh, basis bump that applies with respect to the capital gains also applies with respect to the investment in the fund, making it in incredibly tax advantaged. So that's sort of just a quick overview of how uh, the rules work. We'll, we, might, we might have some time to get a little bit more granular. So this sounds like a, a phenomenal opportunity, and it is. But it obviously still only makes sense if the investment that you're making is in something that you have faith and that will ultimately turn a profit. In other words, all the tax benefits in the world aren't <coughs> going to help you if you invest in a transaction that in and of itself is lousy economics. Because the idea here is to defer the capital gain, make the investment into something that's really exciting, and then not pay gain on the disposition of that investment. 
So uh, there are a lot of offerings in, uh, in the market today. Our, we work with a huge number of uh, transaction sponsors, both doing single, uh, real estate, single project real estate deals, blind pool deals where the uh, money goes in and they then search for various uh, transactions on a go forward basis. Also working on some bespoke transactions with clients who have recognized very significant gains doing their own deals as well. There are a lot of structural requirements that are applicable uh, to, these off to these type of deals. Got to be done through partnerships or corporations, can't be done directly. And uh, there are uh, a lot of rules about how much of the business has to be conducted within the opportunity zone, how much property you can keep out of the opportunity zone, amount that can be kept in cash, amount that has to be invested in tangible property. But I don't think we're going to get that granular today. I think we're exa examining the overview of these rules and how they provide ac aspect for uh, social impact investing. And speaking of which, I think our next panelist has one of the largest fund offerings in the space and one that's received an awful lot of attention. I don't know, Mike, is it going to me, Mike? <laughs> I guess so. Thank you, um, thank you very much, Mark. Um, just a, a couple words on that. Uh, Mayor Brown has a couple of, and Mark, have a couple of excellent white papers. So if you have less than a photographic memory, if you're like me, you can barely remember what you ate for breakfast this morning, don't worry. <laughs> we can hook you up with that. It'd be great. And to transition over the Dan, um, just briefly, I mean, Skybridge is obviously one of the largest and more successful fund managers in the world, um, and to especially to enter this space. I'm wondering if you could take us just a step back a little bit to 2018 when you started the Opportunity Zone Fund, and tell us a little bit, as best you can, sort of why then, um, why now, and sort of, Mark, I think you made an excellent point earlier in that, yeah, tax benefits are great, but tax benefits with little to no return, what's the point? So how do you choose your investments in the fund, and, and how has it been received by your allocators as well? Great, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll touch on a couple of things. So, you know, obviously, um, you know, uh, Mark did a great job just kind of sketching out the benefits of the program, right? And clearly the, the tax incentives are exceptionally attractive, right? And so, you know, in early 2018, um, I guess it was January, February 18, I remember, you know, reading the, the TCGA one Saturday morning, the, the Trump tax bill, and, you know, you come across the opportunity language and you're like, this is going to be like a big deal, right? Um, and, you know, I, I spoke to our CIO on the phone later that morning and we're like, this is great. Like, we have to do something here, right? We, this is interesting for us. This is, uh, meaning us partners of Skybridge, this is interesting for, we think, our existing client base. This will be interesting for a, a whole new universe of prospective clients. And so we made the decision pretty early on in 2018 to, uh, to, to, to start to build a product. Um, a couple of things that I would highlight um, that you know, are, are critically important, um, I'll cover at a high level, right, is like, number one, you know, Mark touched on it, Michael touched on it, right? Like this is a, you can make opportunities on real estate and business investments. We are focused on real estate investing. Um, so the way to think about it, the way we always frame it when we sit down with somebody to talk about our product is like, this is a development real estate fund first, right? So question number one is, hey, do you want to own development real estate? Do you want to own it at this stage of the cycle? Do you want to own it with this liquidity? Do you want to own it with Skybridge as your partner, right? So that's question number one. If, if you don't like development real estate as an asset class, then there's really no reason to be having a conversation around, you know, a QOF, right? Because there's a danger with any tax incentive product where like people spend, and you saw this at the point of max hype about a year ago in Opportunity Zone land, where, you know, you could have a conference and people only spoke about the tax benefits. They didn't talk about real estate investing. This is a real estate development fund first with a 10 year expected hold period, right? So the real estate is the most important part. Tax incentive comes second, right? So I think that's critically important, right? So if you're looking at any fund, if you're if you're you know interested in our fund or digging into our fund, right? Like those are the most important questions first. What's the current portfolio look like? What's the pipeline look like? Um, and then you know I I would make a couple of um, a couple of other points as well. Like from a you know this is a mission driven investing you know panel, right? Um, they're in the world of OZ investing, right? So like I've been on this circuit now for a while and done a lot of events like this, right? And you actually have people, you know, will sit on stage or will say publicly like, hey, you know, we love this OZ deal because this OZ deal is like, you know, halfway baked and we're stepping into it and like, you know, like time out everybody, right? Like this is, remember the spirit of the OZ program. Spirit of the OZ program is to create 
economic, job, economic growth and jobs in low-income communities in the U.S., right? So we are not, you know, Skybridge does not self-identify as, you know, ESG investors, right? That, that's not what we do, right? I think we are, you know, the president of Skybridge has a great phrase, like we're accidental do-gooders in this case, right? Tax incentives are really exciting. You need to structure a deal a certain way to get the tax incentives, right? But that said, you know, we take our responsibility, you know, as a participant in the space very seriously, right? Meaning that there's only one good type of OZ deal, in my opinion, right? Like, that's a, that's a ground up real deal where you're creating, you know, hundreds of jobs and you're really building something and you're having an impact on that community, right? You're putting, you know, like we're building a hotel in New Orleans right now that's creating, has created a couple hundred construction jobs. It's gonna create over 200 permanent jobs. That's in a low income community in New Orleans. Um, that's exciting, right? Like that, that, is, that is pretty cool to be able to say that, hey, we know that we've created those jobs. We, we, we are, you know, there are gonna be economic benefits um, uh, to those, uh, to that community. And at the same time, you know, we think that that's a really good deal that is, you know, competitively, economically with any other real estate development deal, right? That's the only way to think about it. It's not like, oh, what's the deal? You know, like I remember early on here, somebody was making a pitch and they were kind of like, it, like you would do from uni bonds, like adjusting the expected return, like what's the, you know, taxable equivalent yield? They were pitching an OZ deal. That's a crazy thing to do, right? Like this is, tax benefits go on top of your deal, right? Do you have a good real estate deal? That's great, okay, if you have it, can you structure it the right way? Can you be a responsible participant in the market? Uh, and if you can, that's really exciting, right? It's hard to find those deals and you have to be very selective, but you know, um, there is definitely a lot of interesting opportunity out there. Uh, and lastly, I touch on one other thing, and this is one of the big differentiators of our product versus some of the rest in the marketplace, right? The Opportunity Zone program has got a fair amount of, you know, I would say unsophisticated and negative publicity around like this is a tax break for the wealthy, right? Which, you know, clearly it is folks who have cap gains tend to be wealthier individuals who are gonna take advantage of the program, obviously, right? But remember the big, the, the spirit of this program is to unlock stagnant capital, right? To cause folks to realize cap gains and redeploy it, right? So it's really exciting in that respect, right? Now, coming back to the product type and product structure, right? Like Skybridge's product, our product, Skybridge Opportunities on REIT is a, is a private REIT structure, a credit investor standard, $100,000 minimum, 1099 tax reporting. This is a relatively accessible product, right? So this criticism that, you know, Opportunity Zone funds are only for the ultra high net worth clients who are, you know, dropping $50 million in a fund, right? Like th this is not, that's the case in some cases, right? Um, but this was really, really important to us as we built the product. The idea was like, look, you want to democratize access to this program, right? And I realize there could be somebody in the audience who's like, hey, 100K minimum is not really democratized, but it is, right? Practically in the world of alternative investments, if, you know, if we're having a realistic conversation, right? So, you know, we are, we are, you know, if you compare our product versus the, basically the entire rest of the slate out there, I think you'd find that ours is much more accessible and usable for the typical, you know, mass affluent, high net worth investor in the U.S., which was an important point, right? Because we think that exciting program, that the, this is not a program for billionaires. It's, it's a program for, you know, it's going to sound corny, but for, you know, the doctor and the dentist and the lawyer who has... We're late stage in the cycle, they got a couple hundred K cap gains, right? They realized them and they want to be tax efficient with them and development real estate works in their portfolio, right? I mean, we're a great solution for that. So with that, back to Mike. Thanks very much, Dan. I think I'm gonna add uh, accidental do-gooder to my LinkedIn bio if I can borrow that. That's great, we all should. Um, something uh, to keep in mind for later on, I kind of want to delve into later in the panel a little bit more specifics, nitty gritty for Mark or Dan or Tharsis about how you pick <laughs> the investments that you do and what, like you mentioned the New Orleans project, which I think is a great example, but what sort of goes into portfolio construction and that kind of thing. But before we do that, I'd like to pivot to Tharsis for a moment and kind of talk about the difference here between opportunity zones, which we just discussed, um, and sort of this whole overlay of impact investing. Like it can be like an alphabet soup of all of these terms. 
terms, right, when it comes to this impact investing space, ESG. And a lot of times people who aren't super invested in the space or who don't pay a lot of attention to it may not understand, may not know. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to delineate a little more between sort of what Dan does and some of what Mark does and also what Tharsis does when it comes to selecting ESG factors and also as part of the panel, the role of AI and machine learning in developing all this. So if you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, analytics, screening, construction, that kind of thing. Sure, great. absolutely. So when we look at mission-driven investing or <laughs> impact investing or socially responsible investing within an ESG framework, uh, when we look at the marketplace, I think there are two basic approaches. Number one, the standard approach, quote unquote, uh, which is really taking, taking data from the issuers themselves. Uh, so that are provided either uh, via service or that are self-disclosed, right? So the leaders in the marketplace in terms of data vendors that provide uh, either uh, ESG, ESG scores or ESG data, uh, they are taking this approach. And then there is a second approach, which is a more emerging approach where um, <laughs> uh, uh, companies are trying to uh, look at alternative sources. I'm talking about NGOs, I'm talking about uh, news or uh, patents or uh, legal opinions uh, to try to have a more holistic view of when, what is ESG uh, when we are uh, trying to evaluate a company uh, on a systematic manner, right? And then that's where um, uh, AI comes into play, right? So when we look at uh, the second approach where uh, we are trying to process heterogeneous data sources of data, uh, and then trying to come up with a systematic framework on how to evaluate uh, ESG investing, uh, you need to have uh, data processing capabilities. So I'm talking about really building cloud native uh, environments. I'm talking about leveraging natural language processing so we are able to process uh, unstructured data, identify public listed companies or private companies, uh, and then what are uh, the events or the issues or controversial uh, issues, scenarios that they are involved with. So when we look at, for instance, uh, Dieselgate, right, that, which happened um, um, half a decade bef uh, ago uh, with Volkswagen, right? So that event happened, uh, triggered uh, a kind of a ESG screening scenario, uh, but uh, all the data vendors, most of the data vendors, they were actually looking at data disclosed by the company itself, which is actually disclosed on a semi-annual or annual basis. So if when we look at uh, ESG benchmarks out there, it took a while to update those ESG benchmarks. When you look at asset management firms um, that were employing systematic approach, uh, they didn't know what to do with that, uh, to be in line with their systematic strategy, right? So that's a motivation uh, to really build a superior uh, ESG framework where we can leverage um, machine learning to um, uh, deliver a couple of benefits. One is really uh, frequency. When an event happens, we are able to quickly react. Uh, secondly, is coverage, right? If you only take into consideration information disclosed by the companies themselves, you're gonna end up with large caps only, public listed companies mostly. It's very hard to have reliable information private companies, right? And granularity as well, right? So uh, we talked about impact investing, social responsible investing, governance, environmental, social, mission driven. Um, all these things are kind of different dimensions of really on how to be responsible when you are investing or how to be aligned with your values. So uh, a good product needs to be granular. So we can really uh, customize to different needs for different asset management firms, right? So that's where uh, really uh, you can leverage uh, advanced techniques uh, to process a myriad of data sources to deliver coverage, frequency, granularity, right? And then we can take one step further uh, and, and uh, uh, um, uh, look at analytics, right, which Axioma, uh, definitely it's a leading firm uh, in, the in the analytics space. So can we actually um, um, uh, quantify performance attribution to ESG factors, right? Not only looking at uh, to what extent your performance is coming from uh, country region uh, sectors or style factors, actually to what extent your performance is coming from how environmentally friendly you are or how, uh, how strong your, is your governance. So I think um, those are two major trends uh, that I see today. Number one, the emergence of firms that, try, that, are, that are trying to leverage uh, alternative data sources to deliver a more holistic uh, framework leveraging machine learning. And number two, um, analytics that are trying to uh, um, have ESG 
uh, within a systematic approach as a factor-based uh, model uh, that can not only uh, explain your performance in terms of performance attribution, but actually guide you uh, <laughs> moving forward. How can you deliver alpha while you're aligned with your values? Thanks very much. Um, that's really helpful. So, you know, in my day job with Hedge Fund Alert, I talk to a lot of fund managers, right, who say that they're using machine learning. They say that they're using artificial intelligence. And I ask them, how? And there's always pause. And uh, there's like a lot of blah, 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 blah. And it makes like very little to no sense. Um, and they're <laughs> just being a straight shooter. It's, it's honest. I mean, there's, there's so many sort of quant funds that are set up that, you know, machine learning, AI, these are these new buzzwords, right? Like allocators want to hear them. Service providers want to hear them. Like it's, it's, it's something that they think they can generate actual sources of, of alpha from. And I believe that. But there's also like a problem speaking to a lot of like family offices, speaking the pension plan advisors where they want to know specifically how are you using machine learning, how are you using artificial intelligence, and how is that making me money, right? Um, so with that, I think, Tharsis, if you could capitalize a little bit on that and go into sort of how do you present this to allocators? Why should I invest in that? And then from there, we could take a step back and maybe hit on those same related points from the opportunity zone perspective. So my approach to that is actually by uh, tackling uh, the concerns first, but uh, because when you look at um, uh, the marketplace uh, and when you try to bring uh, new uh, technologies, um, uh, a lot of people are skeptical. Uh, as you uh, uh, start your uh, conversation, you showcase that. that. Uh, so I would tackle first the concerns, right? So what are the major challenges out there when it comes to trying to deliver um, uh, machine learning in your investment process, in particular ESG investing? So I think uh, number one is definitely transparency, right? So uh, this comes from a regulatory perspective as well as from a, an investor perspective, right? Uh, particularly if you are talking to an asset owner or a pension fund. So you, can, you really need to um, uh, dismythify the fact, the, the belief that uh, if you are employing uh, advanced analytics or machine learning, uh, you are actually employing a black box, right? Uh, so you, can, you really need to showcase uh, the interpretability of uh, your uh, investment framework. So every time that you are making a decision, whether you are screening out a, comp a company or whether you are overweighting another company based on your uh, ESG factors, uh, you need to be able to backtrack that piece of information uh, and explain uh, in English, really, uh, why, was that, why, why was that decision made by the machine, right? So I think uh, interpretability uh, and uh, transparency uh, is key. So Axioma and stocks, uh, we uh, are uh, a leading uh, firm in the indexing space, so we are very good at really uh, producing products that are transparent, rule-based, and then really communicating with transparency with our regulators and investors. So I think uh, number one thing uh, is really trying to make sure that you have a transparent, rule-based, uh, and replicable uh, strategy when you are talking with your stakeholders. Thank you. Um, Dan, do you want to kind of go into some of the same implications for Opportunity Zones, and then maybe we could switch back to Mark to talk a little bit about, you know, when you're working with your clients to set up these kind of funds, what are some of those um, concerns as well? Sure, and I mean, even to, uh, and I, I, I mean, this touches a bit on the, the prior panel, right? I mean, and, and, you know, away from, you know, away from our, uh, the real estate fund that we're talking about today, you know, we are, you know, we are, very large hedge fund allocators, right? So, you know, we invest in every strategy and sub-strategy you can think of, right? We cover over a thousand funds. Um, at any given time, you know, we might be allocated to 100, 125, right? Um, it, this is a, you know, I, I think Thars is it, it's spot on, right? Like you could, you, you could, not to spend too much time on this, right? But this is one of the biggest challenge with, you know, quantitative strategies or rules-based strategies or systematic strategies, whatever you want to call them, right, is this inability for the, the manager to, to articulate the risk that they're taking and how they're making money, right? I mean, that's a whole other panel discussion, right? Um, it's fascinating, right, because you have guys that consistently make money, 
um, but they're often of like a different world and they can't necessarily articulate how they're making money to somebody like me or, or you know, someone in my seat as an allocator, right? Um, and so that's really, really hard, right? Because if you're a professional investor, right, like how do you get comfortable with, then you basically have to just look backward and say like, okay, empirically, this guy's a moneymaker. He's an, he's an alpha guy, right? We don't invest that way at Skybridge, right? A lot of people do. <laughs> so like that's, you know, it, it, like, there, but there's, there's the predictability of that strategy is really the predictability, just your only confidence comes from the historical tracker, right? So it's a fascinating concept and idea. As a result, like if you look at our portfolios, you see that we don't have any exposure to quantitative strategies. We, we don't think you have enough predictive power, right? We don't dispute alpha being there and alpha is real. It, it, it is there, right? Empirically, no question, right? But, you know, how does that strategy perform in different environments? How does it evolve, right? And this is a question of data and articulation. And I, I think, yeah, I think over time, the market will get better at this, but it's still not there yet, right? Um, uh, you know, in the world of OZ investing, I think the important thing to touch on, the, 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 the hot topic in OZ investing from a data perspective, right, is what data you make available versus what data is required to be made available, right? And so, you know, if anybody has followed the OZ program from the beginning, right, and this is totally different from, you know, the, the, the yeah, this is pretty simple stuff at the end of the day, right? You know, like Senator Cory Booker, who's a sponsor, co-sponsor of legislation with Tim Scott, you know, like it originally what got stripped out of his legislation was various reporting requirements related to, you know, how many jobs did you create, et cetera, right? Um, we are big advocates for those reporting requirements, right? We think that would be great. We think it helps folks better evaluate, you know, a given project and, and how a manager is, um, is, is, you know, implementing uh, the program, right? So we're, we're all for the, the data reporting. We'll voluntarily, like, you know, if somebody asks us, we're happy to, to give everything that we, we have, data related to a specific project. Um, but, it, you know, just to be clear, like the, the idea of having some central required, you know, the data um, reporting requirement for, for OZ deals and for OZ funds is, is, is a great thing and we support it 100%. Um, probably makes sense to talk about how Congress was seeing this and how this uh, interacts with social impact investing. Uh, Congress did give this initial thought, and when they did, uh, it was very limited. And what they said was that there were seven types of investments which will not qualify for an opportunity zone deal. Uh, golf course, country club, a uh, liquor store, a package store where you take away the liquor as opposed to a nightclub or a bar, which that does qualify, a uh, massage parlor, um, and then there were a couple of other ones that were considered ineligible. Now, to be clear, though, the Opportunity Zone program does not require that uh, an, an investment generate any particular number of jobs or that it necessarily be consistent with uh, the existing uh, infrastructure or tenor of the neighborhood. And uh, so if you're looking at one of these transactions, it could actually be uh, upscale housing in a neighborhood which is in transition, a gentrification type project. It could also be a project that uh, does not generate a significant number of jobs within the community and, and still be eligible. Uh, there is, uh, as uh, Dan said, there is, there's some proposed legislation out there that would expand the list of, trans, of transactions which are ineligible. The really good news about this proposed legislation is that it's proposed to be prospective. So if you were to go into an opportunity zone deal today and put in a luxury condo project in an area that has, is, is essentially low income, that would still work. Although after the legislation passes, it's not clear whether uh, or they're gonna be, there are gonna be restrictions around uh, the building of residential real estate that's not consistent with the underlying uh, income levels of, of the community. So that that's one change that they're thinking of. Uh, with respect to these reporting requirements that uh, Dan went into, uh, already we've seen the Internal Revenue Service responding to um, pressure from the investment community because the original Qualified Opportunity Zone Forum had virtually no information whatsoever in the one for 2018. The one we just got, which is going to be applicable for 2019, requires uh, significantly more information, plus the, the bill that Cory Booker has proposed would 
require funds to have a higher compliance burden and provide this information. It's not clear what they're going to do with this information once they get it, because there's no requirement in this legislation that the projects have a certain social impact or that they provide a certain number of jobs. I think it's really just along the lines of seeing essentially where government money is spent and how it's spent. And, and it allows, you know, it, it, it allows groups that are more mission driven, right, uh, to, to source certain types of projects or managers, right? So, you know, that, that's the, you know, I mean, Mark is spot on, right? Like there are, there are, you can definitely do certain types of OZ deals, right? That if you are a impact investor, you might look at that deal and say like, huh, not really consistent with the spirit of the program. That's still a good OZ deal from a tax perspective, right? But you know, you will, if you're a manager, I think you will lose a certain type of investor if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're not conscious of, you know, the spirit of the program, right? Which is difficult, you know, the data helps, I think helps prospective investors, you know, identify what type of deals, you know, managers are trying to do or have done. Right. And, and so um, along those lines, the, the, incentive that was created was not focused on the benefit that's being derived. It, it essentially is looking to private industry uh, to invest in low-income communities with the hope that those investments will lift the low-income communities up. But there, it, it's not a very strict uh, correlation between the what constitutes an opportunity zone and what uh, what the deal has to be to be qualified. And furthermore, uh, as Dan noted, the, uh, the census tract list was developed in 2010. In not nine years is a long time for a low-income community. And in fact, a lot of the communities which were designated as low-income based on the 2010 census today, you wouldn't think of as low-income at all. Specifically in, in Manhattan, the area uh, just above Hudson Yards is now treated as an opportunity zone because in 2010, before Hudson Yards was being considered, it, it was a very low-income neighborhood. Now with Hudson Yards there, this neighborhood is essentially on fire and question really whether or not it needs OZ benefits in order to attract development. So you get the, and that's the type, type of a negative press, as it were, that the New York Times gave. They said, look, this is a, the, uh, the program is a, an, a, a program for billionaires and also the Amazon deal in Long Island City, another area which was very low income in uh, 2010, but since that time has seen just an unbelievable boon of development is also an opportunity zone and people are asking, when Amazon was originally looking in there, as we know, um, uh, Cortez, AOC, AOC was very, very vocal in that, uh, is it appropriate to give uh, Amazon or Amazon investors this level of tax breaks in connection with an investment in a community which seemed to be really robust. So if you're looking at it from a solely, purely uh, social impact investment, there are some challenges. Just one last topic that I, I, I want to talk about, which not necessarily directly on the social impact point, but uh, that we're getting, a, we're seeing a lot of inquiry about, which is that uh, we've got clients who have recognized significant capital gains and want to cre create funds, but don't necessarily have uh, investment opportunities yet that they fully vetted. And the question often comes up is, can I create a QOF structure and essentially leave my powder dry? Can I start the clock ticking on these tax benefits and then continue to wait until I find an appropriate transaction, whereas, whether it's an investment in a fund or whether or not it's a bespoke transaction that you're going to invest in directly? And the answer to that is yes that you can create essentially a private deal to hold the money, and you can hold the money actually for up to 30 months uh, within the structure and, and continue to get deferral. So for those uh, folks out there who want to reserve some money for social impact investment through the Qualified Opportunity Zone structures, uh, you can do that and create these essentially private holding vehicles for the money until you uh, find the deal which is appropriate for you. Thank you very much. Um, we are almost out of time, but I would like to do one more thing. I saw a few grimaces in the audience at the reference of AOC, so we'll stay out of politics or else we'll truly be here all night. Um, but if you all could take like 30 seconds or so and just hit on sort of one final point, however you'd like to do this, and Tharsis, we'll, we'll start with you if that's okay, which is sort of if you're talking to, Mark, if you're talking to a potential client who's gonna set up an opportunity zone fund, Dan, if you're talking to a potential allocator, 
Cantor, who might invest in Skybridge, Lars is if you're talking to one of your clients on the ESG front. Um, what's the elevator pitch and what are the biggest challenges that remain? Well, I think um, um, to answer this question, I will make a few predictions uh, for uh, the future. I, think, I believe that uh, 10 years from now, I would say that uh, at least 50% of the AUM on core benchmarks will be ESG compliant. Um, uh, I think uh, it, is a it is a trend that is here to stay, to be compliant uh, on uh, core benchmarks. Uh, Stocks uh, launched recently the um, ESG X uh, family where we provide uh, transparent, low-cost access to uh, ESG compliant uh, companies that replicate an economy. Uh, and uh, right away, we launched an ETF with State Street. We have options, futures traded back of the index. Uh, the biggest ETF uh, of the past decade was an, e uh, an ESG ETF as well. So I think uh, 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 ESG compliant uh, core uh, benchmarks, uh, I think uh, it's going to be a massive trend and massive inflow uh, in the next uh, five uh, of, or 10 years. And therefore, you need to have a strong partner that has uh, a history in providing uh, low cost, transparent, high quality access to these uh, benchmarks. And then that's what Stocks uh, does. And Axiom is there to provide the analytics uh, for uh, your portfolio construction as well as performance attribution analytics. The, the the elevator pitch for you know for our, our opportunity zone fund uh, you know is very straightforward right so um, you know we believe this is uh, an exceptionally user friendly way for you know high net worth individuals to access the opportunity zone program uh, private reach structure uh, monthly dealing through the end of December of 2021. Uh, meaning that, you know, you've realized the gain, your clock's ticking, you have 180 days to get in an OZ fund. The first of every month we're raising capital. That's the date that goes on your tax return when you elect an OZ deferral, right? So we're there the first of every month. Uh, 1099 tax reporting, no K-1, no state tax filing requirements, which, you know, matters in the world of, of, of real estate, especially for, you know, our product is commingled as a multi-asset mandate, right? So to own this in a REIT structure, uh, it just simplifies things for, for, the, for the end client uh, in a lot of ways. You know, top tier slate of service providers. So Bank of New York's the administrator, KPMG is the auditor, KPMG is doing pre-deal and ongoing deal compliance for every single deal that we do as well. This is critically important, right? We're doing everything possible to mitigate compliance and regulatory risk related to the OZ program, uh, which is meaningful, right? You need to be very thoughtful about what you are doing here, right? And like we have in every case, right, we have we have chosen to be the most, take the most conservative interpretation of the regs uh, and the law that's out there. Um, so KPMG, Bank of New York, Altus is a third party valuation agent, so independent, we are not marking the real estate in our book. That is done independent. We actually had the, the first markup on our first deal in September. So that was nice to see. Simpson Thatcher is the legal counsel. So again, this is a really easy to access, you know, we think institutional quality product, um, if you want to access development real estate um, in opportunity zones available to retail clients. What I'd say if to a client who's considering this, that this is probably a once in a lifetime investment opportunity to, to use these structures. Uh, I think that uh, what's going to, I think that the revenue estimates uh, that what this is going to cost are going to so far exceed the estimates that there's no way that these are going to last forever. And so I think that it is important, but I think that existing structures will continue to be grandfathered. So I think that for taxpayers who have significant capital gains, that uh, taking advantage of this at this time is a really smart thing to do. Thank you all very much. Round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.